So this is what an untreated check is supposed to look like. <laughs> Lots of good weed, weeds in here, lamb's quarters, the, the water hemp, some velvet leaf. Uh, this is gonna be, it's a great comparison when you have this much weed seed in here that your untreated check can really tell you. If we did no control, if we trade nothing in this field, this is what you would have had. This is not what we want to have. So we now see as you move forward here in our treatments, the importance of weed management in cultural control uh, in, these, in these plants. Uh, and we just can't survive by just letting them go willy-nilly like this. And, and one thing, Mike, is that the soybeans look pretty tall, but uh, as I was chatting with Venancio, it's a lot of it is that they're just competing with the weeds. And so, you know, because they're, they're competing for light, they're just growing up as high as they can, and they're not, they're not wide. If we were to hand weed or pull out all the weeds here, you'd see tall and skinny soybeans. Um, so there's not, not likely as much biomass on them as some of our well-weeded plots. Yeah, and probably not as much yield. As we look at this, the inner nodes have lengthened out. They look, the people like these large beans, but in many cases, these tall beans competing don't have the yield. Here's our second treatment, which is Metribuzin at five ounces per acre. And uh, right now we're looking at 46% control of the water hemp compared to our untreated check. Um, and the Metribuzin did a, did a pretty good job with a lot of the other weeds, so it doesn't look nearly as weedy. Uh, it's controlling a lot of the other broad leaves and uh, most of the grasses, um, but uh, still quite a bit of water hemp. I mean, given the dry weather after application, five ounces of metribuzin, again, going back to the point that I made about earlier about, you know, we've taken that pressure off now. So now here's the situation of 46% control. It would have been a lot easier when these were four inches tall to come in and try to control just just the water hemp because really we're looking at just some water hemp there's a couple other weeds spread out there try to do a timing on the one over here the untreated check when they were four inches tall mm. the density of weeds and in, in the in the different species that we were trying to target as well so here it would have been a little, a little easier and so again even even a not perfect two pass program with a pre that didn't didn't fully give you that that 100 percent control that we want coming back in at least it knocked that pressure off the timing of it wouldn't be nearly as important as it would have been on the untreated Absolutely, and and the uh, metribuzin uh, being a photosystem two inhibitor um, it, from our greenhouse trials, we didn't expect great control because we likely have resistance to that herbicide group. Sure, and the and the other thing too with metribuzin is that when we do it pre, we have to make sure that that you know as we start going back to some of these older chemistries that we used to use, you know, ten and fifteen, twenty years ago, we have to kind of remind ourselves to read that label and be really mindful at planting depth on metribuzin. You know, we can't be real shallow on our planting depth. You want to have that planting depth down at, a, at probably an inch and a half deep to, uh, you know, to make sure that we have that metribuzin, you know, over top and it's it's not down in, in where the seed is. So we don't want shallow planted soybeans and then put metribuzin over the top. Brian, you talked about resistance. So obviously we don't have full resistance in this population, which is a good thing. We, we have some plants that made it through and you know, it's uh, it's still active out here and susceptible, right. at least to, to that to that class of, to, uh, yeah. five. Yeah, plus so, five. So we would have expected, you know, at least eighty, maybe ninety, even a hundred percent control on non-resistant water hemp or or, you know, or other pig weeds, but that this is only getting forty-six percent uh, does kind of back up our our finding of, of yeah. some resistance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And the other thing is we look at metribuzin, um, you know, we can't forget about this, this chemistry here that we have because it's going to be really useful to use with other products um, for the control of water hemp as well as when we're dealing with, with uh, mare's tail. Mare's tail is going to be another important one as a pre-product. Um, so again, uh, metribuzin, we're going to see more of that used and that's going to be kind of more of a standard product, I think, because it's got a lot of flexibility to mix with a lot of the other group 14s we can mix it with some of our group 15s. Yep. Oldie but goodie. Yeah. <laughs>
first rate at 0.6 ounces per acre used pre and we had zero percent control of the water hemp uh, at this point in the study and you can see it did a great job controlling most everything else uh, but because of that the water hemp has really taken off so we've got a high density of water hemp here a lot of those early seedlings came up and survived and now each water hemp individual is is quite thin and, and tall um, because there's so many individuals the density is so high in this plot and being a group two we know resistance is there this is one of the first products that we noticed this 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 coming through on as a group two is the guys in normal practice was to put something like a classic or a first rate out there and we saw that failure and, and we, we knew we were in trouble with this class of, of uh, herbicide also and it it definitely shows and, and and group two there's the ALS inhibitors there's a lot of resistance too because they you know they, they last a long time in the soil and so they're, they're kind of acting on a lot of weed seeds and so there's more pressure um, to select for those resistant weeds. And if you look back, I mean, group twos are our primary herbicide group that we use on soybeans. Yeah, I mean, that's, Harmony, I mean, classic, it's, there's so many of them that have been used over mm -hmm. the years, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and so group twos are really popular. Mm -hmm. You know, they were popular in corn as well, but soybeans, mm -hmm. a lot of our chemistries, you know, include group twos in the mix. Mm -hmm. Yep, so here we've got, we've got Valor SX, a, uh, a PPO inhibitor. We've got three ounces per acre used pre. And uh, Valor SX, the, the PPOs have generally been very effective on water hemp. Um, but as we were talking about earlier with the weather this year, we're looking at about, we're looking at about 12% control right now. It, early on in June, it was about 40% control, and that's dropped as the season has gone on. And Valor's one that, you know, Valor itself, by itself, you know, at, at the three ounce rate, it would be one that we wouldn't generally expect and, and, and expect it to give a season long control by itself. I mean, Valor, we're gonna, many times we're gonna be putting some metribuzin with that to help extend that out, um, you know, through the season. Looks like we've got some sound issues with the, the warrant treatment, but uh, you know, warrant being group 15, a chloracetamide, uh, very effective on water hemp and, and pigweeds in general. Um, and, and these group 15 herbicides are really important in, uh, in overlapping residuals in trying to control these herbicide resistant weeds that have resistance to other chemistries. Um, these overlapping residuals with the, with the chloros Dedamides is uh, has been key in other states. Um, anyone want, want to add anything to that? Yeah, just to get those things that have emerged. Maybe you waited a couple of days, uh, and we had some things come up. You know, warrant was not going to control that, but the the roundup will take care of that and, and keep you on track. Uh, overall, we're looking at sixty five percent control. In the plot so for a pre pre that's pretty darn good again we wouldn't be going by itself but we'd definitely be following up with with a post but 
as a pre, it, it, it did its job in keeping the, the, the water hemp pressure down so we can come back in with our post application. Yeah, and uh, so warrants a, a, a chlorocetamide, uh, group 15, and uh, we don't expect any resistance, uh, at least currently, from, from warrant. So it's a good one to have in the mix, um, a, a, as well as any other group 15s if you have water hemp. Now, Mike, it, it's not it's not as effective on the on the horseweed populations that we're getting, right? Right. Yeah. No. no I, well, yeah. The warrant wouldn't have any control. Neither would we expect the outlook of the duels that we would have available in a group 15 for mm -hmm. uh, for water or for for mare's tail rather. So for but but you know we think about you know our warrants, the harness, the outlooks, our duels mm -hmm. of the world. Okay, the group 15. Yeah. You know, we're, we're always accustomed to thinking of when did we always use those? We've used them for grass control. We've used them for nut sedge. That's mm -hmm. what everybody's kind of ingrained to think. It's grass and nut sedge. If you ask growers, what do we use those for? Well, I either got nut sedge or grasses. Mm -hmm. We kind of don't realize that, mm -hmm. that those group 15s actually are good on the pigweed species. Yeah. And so well, that's why, again, we're going to be using some, some warrants, the duels, the outlooks for, you know, to pick up some of these pigweed species. Mm -hmm. um, you know, also the nightshades, we can, you know, we can pick up some nightshade control with them too. So they have some other activity yeah. on, on some broadleaf weeds, but right. primarily we think about them as our pre-grass herbicides. And what are you guys out there trying to put them on? Right. You know, water hemp and why would we expect control? And that's why. All right, so this is uh, treatment six. Uh, we came back in here with Valor XLT, which is different than our Valor XX. Uh, SX back on treatment four, where we, we have a uh, classic in there. So it's four ounces of uh, Valor XLT with that addition of the classic in there with the, with the, uh, with the Valor, and then adding five ounces of Metribuzin. So really the, the classic and the XLT is probably not doing much since we have the resistance to the group two, and that's what classic is. But you see the Metribution coming in here and cleaning things up with that addition of the two of them together. Uh, by itself, Metribution was at 46%. With together, we had 49%, so it improved uh, the overall. Remember, Valor by itself was only 12% control. So right now, we're at 49 on this plot. So we do see what, what Metribution brings to the table uh, in that addition to the Valor and improving that control. And it does look pretty good. Another thing that we need to should point out, I think, with some of these ratings that we have, um, Brian did ratings at uh, at different different timings. Uh, the timing, the first timing of it that we have listed is actually um, June 11th. So we're looking at about just about 30 days, or just in that ballpark of 30 days after application. And the ratings that we're giving you right now are the July 24th rating. So that's taking yeah. it out another month. So we're out, six, you know, more than 60 days into the season. Um, you know, looking back, even with this treatment, um, for example, on the yeah. Valor XLT Metribuzin, you know, we're at 91% uh, control on June 11th. So now we look at it from a grower's perspective of we put down the pre on May 7th or 8th, whenever we made the applications, we come back in, you know, you know, in that 30 day ballpark on our early post emergence. Now we're only coming back in. We had 91% control then. So really on that 30 day when we would generally be coming back in with our with our post we're coming back in our weed pressure wasn't that bad but we're going to clean it up and, and take it the rest of the season so yeah. you know we have to really differentiate between are we really trying to look at at 60 days you know after or 30 days um so 60 days after you know it, it's kind of harder to think that you know 50 percent control i'd rather be coming in at 91 percent control you know 30 days earlier to clean up what was there yeah it did a hell of a job mm-hmm at that that 30 day window yeah so a good program on it and i think that kind of shows that maybe some of the some of the valor started to go um you know and again the same thing when when we had the valor by itself you know 40 percent control on june 11th 12 percent control on the 24th of july so again i think we're seeing that here with the metribuzin and is really taking it you know the rest of the season and the other thing here you know we have that loss of control look at these rows Mm -hmm. I mean, we still have light penetrating. This is not full mm -hmm. canopy. So right. we still have some light coming through mm -hmm. here, which if we didn't, and with these beans were a little fuller, these ones might not have come through. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we, we do see that uh, that advantage of the, 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 the light 
taking effect on these ones popping up through here. Okay, so here's treatment seven. This is a, a pre-application, a, a mix of Warren Ultra and Metribuzin. Warren Ultra's course is Warren, group 15, and uh, uh, Reflex, from Safen, group 14. Uh, 40, 48 fluid ounces per acre, and then with that uh, five ounce per acre rate of Metribuzin. And this, uh, of all of our pre-only treatments, this was the most effective. This is controlling Currently, 96% of the water hemp um, as of uh, late July, and then in, in uh, mid-June, it's controlling 98% of the water hemp. Um, and this was our best pre-only program last year as well. And the reason for that is that you've got two effective modes of action that don't have any uh, resistance, or the, that water hemp doesn't have any resistance to. So. Um, the group 14, the PPOs with the reflex, and then the group 15 with the, the chlorocetamides uh, with the warrant. So, so you've got two effective modes of action there, uh, both working really effectively on the water hemp. One thing that we need to probably point out as well, Brian, is that, you know, I know we're live today, but when this is broadcast in October, yeah. we don't know who's tuning in yeah. to, to the, to the to the webinar, mm -hmm. but when we talk about, you know, no resistance to the group 14s or 15s oh, on water, right. it's, it's, it's New York state right, right now. Yep. So if you're in other states, that's a good point. Canada, we know we have other resistance to it. So don't, don't leave today thinking that all well, they said in New York that we don't have resistance to it. And then you try it and you've got group 14 or group 15 resistance that they have in other states. So fortunately yep. for us, we're not dealing with that. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah, we may get folks tuning in from Midwest or We know today South, there's yeah. only five of us in the yeah. field. We're all New Yorkers right yeah. now. So. <laughs> yeah, no, so these, these beans look great. Um, and But then once again, as as we're, we've been saying, there is, there are a handful of water hemp through here. So, you know, that would be enough for those going to seed, you know, each producing thousands of seed that they could, pop, you know, perpetuate that population. Um, so we, we, we really want zero seeds going back into the soil, kind of a zero threshold. Any questions on what's uh, been presented so far? We've gone over all the pre-programs for the soybeans. Did, uh, did anyone else, uh, any other growers or, or crop advisors uh, see successes with those programs or failures with those programs this year? Brian, I do want to point out or should, should mention that uh, when we look at um, using Flexstar Reflex Prefix, um, which is the, the dual and, and Flexstar Max or the, or the Warren Ultra, which is Warren plus, plus Foam Safe. And um, the one thing that we have to look at using, using those as a pre, if we're in a Roundup Ready soybean only situation and we're, we're dealing with you know, resistant tall water hemp, we're going to use, we want to use that, that um, option of coming back in post-emergence with foam safen. Okay. And so if I'm in a Roundup Ready soybean situation, you may want to readjust, you know, where you're going to use that, that reflex or flex star um, to come back in, because if you use it pre, it's going to be taken off the table for a post option. And so we just want to make, make a point that, that we have to be a little bit more strategic um, as, as we start to use some of these pre's 
that also have some post-emergence activity, is it gonna box us out if we wanted to try to use it down the road? Yeah, that's a great point, Mike. Um, and that's and that's from a, a label standpoint, right? Not not necessarily a, a residual, you know, soil active standpoint. Like Emmeline uh, has a, has a comment early on, looking for programs that are compatible with wheat, alfalfa, and vegetables after soybeans. Um, and I'm wondering how you know, a lot of these would would fit with that. I just if real quick uh, allude to what Mike Hunter said there that <clears throat> while we are in New York and, and we are finding these uh, potentially resistant weeds here to the ALSs, the atrazines, the roundups, just keep in mind that a lot of these folks in the Midwest that are dealing with the water hemp, for example, uh, they've recently found, I believe out of the University of Missouri, a six way resistance to uh, herbicides in one water hemp population. So that's resistance to uh, atrazine, your classics, your flex stars, your roundups, uh, your callistos, and then more recently 2,4-D. So if we think about where our, some of our equipment might come from, uh, it's possible that some of our hay or straw or cotton meal type products come from the Midwest. So um, we're just trying to be on the forefront of some of the things that might be coming to New York. Also, you know, kind of going back to that, you know, where, where we're going to use the group 14, um, you know, the reflex of the flex star in a pre-program, you know, if we're in a, if we're in roundup ready, maybe we, we reconsider if we use it as a pre, if we have another um, trait that that's going to give us another um, option on resistant water hemp, whether it's going to be, you know, enlist, depending on where, you know, what the outcome of the dicamba beans, um, the extend beans rather are going to be, um, or Liberty Link beans, if we had that, you know, in the program, you know, planted. That's where, you know, the, the prefix and the Warren Ultra fit really well as a pre-program, um, you know, for the control of, of tall water hemp or resistant tall water hemp. Absolutely. Good points. So uh, I, I'd like to just step in and say, it's also time to go back to the basics. Uh, farmers tend to be frugal. So I, I know some farmers that have selected nozzles and pressures that give them a 15 gallon per acre rate, uh, thinking, hey, they can use the same set of nozzles to do both Roundup independently of uh, some of their pre-application programs. And I think, you know, when you have water hemp on the farm, uh, herbicide resistant water hemp or any of the other herbicide resistant weeds, you have to really take your best shot at controlling them. So it is, going back to the basics and checking your water quality to make sure that it's in line with what you're putting in the tank. You have to look at soil types and organic matter levels to make sure that your rates are adequate. You have to look closely at your nozzle selection and replacement and pressure levels. Yeah, we got to squeeze every, uh, every inch out of the effectiveness on these products while we can. All right, uh, I think I'm gonna go back to sharing the video. And we'll uh, pick up on some uh, pre and post programs now. Okay, here we are with treatment eight. This is Valor XLT and Metribuzin again, the same uh, pre-emergence rates we used earlier. Uh, four ounces per acre with the Valor XLT, five ounces per acre with the Metribuzin. Uh, and then this is followed up by a post application of Cobra at 12 ounces per acre with uh, crop oil at 1%. Uh, 1%. Um, and and this, this treatment, you know, being a two-pass treatment, it's working pretty well. Um, not actually as well as the Warren Ultra and Metribuzin that we just went over. Um, it, it's uh, in as of late July, controlling around 70% of the water hemp. As of uh, mid-June, it was controlling 88%. Last year, this treatment was controlling 98%. So, so that's, what, uh, that's what drought conditions will do. But we do have a trade-off here because we're using our Cobra, we're using the, the PPO inhibitor post 
rather than pre with the with uh, with with the reflex using the in the Warren Ultra. Um, and so, Mike, you were on to yeah. So if we go back to that the the treatment before when we looked at at Warren Ultra and the Metro B was an excellent control, excellent control last year. And again, it would be the you know similar results that we would we would expect from um, from a prefix uh, metribuzin as well because we've got a group 14, we have a group 15, mm -hmm. you know again excellent control. But the one thing that we need to watch with um, with using those again excellent products for it. It's hard to beat the control. But if we were if if for example this instead of being um, extend beans here, um, if it wasn't that if it was say this field was a conventional or a Roundup Ready soybean field that we had that we're dealing with. As soon as we put down, the, you know, the reflex portion of it pre, mm. that takes it off the table to, and out of our toolbox mm. if we need to come back in and clean up a post-emergence um, application over top to control any of the tall water hemp that came through. Mm. So we have the reflex that we've used up. We don't have that option. So again, in conventional or Roundup Ready beans, post-emergence for us in New York, we're looking basically at, at a reflex post-emergence or a cobra. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, on conventional Roundup Ready, if we use the Warren Ultra and say for some reason we didn't get the control that mm -hmm. we've got the last two years, we have to come back in post-emergence. Reflex is no longer an option. We're coming in with Cobra, so right. we'll have this. I mean, so yeah. again, this Valor XLT Metribuse and Cobra, yeah, you know, not bad control, seventy yeah. percent. So, ju you know, just to use that as as an example that that as we put these pre's down and we start doing, you know, we're going to see in in cases earlier I've mentioned that we're going to use group 15s maybe more than once in a season. Some products we can use more than once in the same same um, season, some we can only use one time. And so we have to really watch and plan out ahead of time when we sit down at the kitchen table in the winter time and come up with, with herbicide programs. You know it's nice to have the program say this is what we're going to do. Always have a plan B and a plan C say hey what happens if this plan A doesn't work? What are we going to do to come back in? What's your option for, for B? And then for some reason, if the weather or something else comes in, what if it's plan C? And so plan C for me is always that Hail Mary last in a minute that, boy, our, you know, our plan B was going to be come in at, you know, two to four inch tall weeds at certain crop stage. Well, what if we're beyond that crop stage or certain weed height? Mm -hmm. You know, what's going to be our plan C to come back in and, and, and clean up everything else? So yeah. Cobra, again, for us, in, in many cases, Cobra is going to be the last thing we're going to use on, on water hemp and soybean. Right. And Cobra was in our greenhouse trials, and even at the lowest rate, which was, I think, only a quarter of the full labeled rate, it's, it scorched 100 percent of our water hemp in the greenhouse trials. So, mm -hmm. so that shows you the difference between you know real, real world and drought conditions and limiting uptake of the herbicide. You know, some people reluctant, are reluctant to use something like Cobra on their beans because we have seen quite a bit of burning. And so, what, what do we tell people? You know, when that, you know, in regards to recommending that, yes, it's going to burn your beans in certain situations, certain environmental conditions more than others. But look how these ones, I mean, these came out beautifully. So we do see a little bit of injury early on. Uh, like Mike said, it, it could be our last Hail Mary at the end of the season, but we still have a 45-day pre-harvest interval on Cobra. So mm -hmm. that is, you know, a lot of them are 60, you know, reflex is 60. Mm -hmm. So 45 days is still, you know, it's a month and a half, so it's you still got a plan for it. But I mean, yeah, good product. It's going to be plan C a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the other thing too, we look at the, the Valor Metribuzin in, in by itself, you know, 49% control on July 24th. You know, Brian just went over this treatment here, Valor Metribuzin and the Cobra Post, July 24th, 70% control. So we went from 49% control um, with a Valor Metribuzin by itself. You come back in with, we, you know, with this Cobra and all of a sudden we've brought our control up now from 49 to 70%. Mm -hmm. So we're so we're gaining something. So there was something else that it brought, you know, mm -hmm. you know, to the table for us. Yeah. And it looked yeah. good. Yeah, absolutely. All right, we're going to move on. Treatment nine. 
So treatment nine, again, starts off with the, the Valor XLT and the Metribuzin like we saw in treatment eight. So exactly the same pre-programs. But now we came back with a more aggressive post. So we, we came back with Cobra post in, in treatment eight. Now in treatment nine, we're coming back with uh, Ronda Power Max and Extendamax um, as a post treatment. So, um, you know, again, great control here. We were 87% on, on June 11th. Uh, right now we're looking at 82% control where we were only at 70% control with the, with the Cobra. So we picked up some more, more control uh, of our weeds with that addition of that Roundup and the Extendamax there uh, on, a, on a post situation. So uh, I'm not gonna say it's a kitchen sink, but that's, that's pretty much our kitchen sink of this, of this, whole, of this whole trial in here. So 96% last year. So yeah. So 96, you know, and uh, 82 this year. So we're seeing, in the, in the, and we have this replicated in different areas behind us uh, throughout the trial, and you know, they all look pretty good. All right, so we're we're uh, we're down to treatment number ten here, which was the Warren Ultra Metribuzin Pre, which we saw back in treatment seven, which was our best pre-treatment doctor. Did a great job. As we moved this treatment, the pre again did a fantastic job. Uh, we did add an early post of of uh, the Power Max and the Extended Max in here, just to kind of firm it up. But again, it still looks great. The pre did its job. We came back with early post to kind of keep it clean. Uh, and great, great control with this, this program also. I'm here in front of the, the cultivation plot. So this was actually a, a pre-treatment with Valor XLT and Metribution, same as the others, followed by a post uh, cultivation. And uh, for these small plots, we couldn't get a, a tractor in here to do this. So we just had a two wheeled uh, human powered hoe that we pushed through the plots. And as you can see, it did a pretty good job between the rows, but it did miss a lot of the weeds that were right in the row. Um, and that's pretty common with cultivation. And unfortunately, these are the ones that are gonna be uh, you know, going to seed and competing with the, the soybeans. There are more expensive cultivators that are, can target the in-row zone using finger weeders and other implements, but they need really accurate guidance systems, camera or GPS, um, and can typically control about 50 to 70% of those in-row weeds. Uh, this was a really good year for cultivation because it was so dry um, and, and this plot looked great early on. It was, uh, it, in, in June, it had controlled around 86% of the water hemp, um, but those that did survive, primarily the weeds in the row, as I mentioned, are the ones that you now see have kind of expanded and branched out. Uh, and so now in, in uh, late July, we're at 74%. Here we are, treatment 12. This was an all post application of 
warrant. Okay, so our group 15 plus round up and extend the max. And uh, the control was, was decent, um, but once again, so 74% control, but uh, because of the drought and because of some of the weeds being a little bit bigger than optimal, uh, we don't have 100% control like we might expect. Um, so, so that's what can happen with a little bit of delay. If you're relying 100% on that post program, it can be risky because you can have some escapes um, and then it's, it's already mid-season and you've got less, uh, less time to react. Um, the warrant in this case, you know, as a residual product is uh, you know, preventing the, 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 the successful establishment of water hemp that comes in after that application. So putting down that residual is gonna control these late establishing water hemp, which is what water hemp is really known for, coming in a little later than most weeds. Um, and so the warrant can be effective in that regard, but again, we just didn't get the rain um, that we would have liked to have seen. So this is our second uh, completely post treatment here. Um, treatment number 13, where we went in with uh, PowerMax and ExtendaMax post. Uh, we left out the warrant. So the last time we saw the warrant with these two, here we, we left out the warrant. And you know, like uh, Brian was talking about some of the competition and, and the light, really can see it in here. You look down in the canopy, you see that the, the plants are open. You know, these rows are more open. Uh, many more plants down in that canopy, which really shows you the value of the warrant in there from a residual product here. These plants are really coming back. You can see it's stressing these plants even more. They haven't come close to closing up yet. The canopy, like when we had warrant, they were, you know, canopy was almost closed. Definitely see that the addition of that warrant and, and the, the additional control you get from the residual uh, in, in this product. So definitely a, a good side-by-side -side to see the value of that warrant in there. So this treatment right here that we're looking at, this is uh, Spartan Charge. Spartan Charge is a premix of sulfentrazone and tarfentrazone. Tarfentrazone is AIM, and that's a post-emergence. Um, so this that would be more of a fit if we had some, you know, emerged weeds. You know, we would put the, uh, you know, use the Spartan Charge with it. And then the sulfentrazone is Spartan. And so that's the premix. The one note we would say is that uh, sulfentrazone is not registered in field crops in, in New York State. So these are um, are being used um, demonstration. Um, this is just a demonstration, a comparison of, of looking at the active ingredient sulfentrazone. And we would look at this, and really, in all fairness, we would be comparing it to the Valor in the plot here. So we have Valor SX um, in the plot by itself as well. So this is Spartan Charge. Um, eight ounces of Spartan Charge, which is 0.2 active um, pounds of active ingredient of sulfentrazone. And you can see that we didn't get, you know, 100% control of it by any means. We're looking at 66% control on June 11th and 67% control on July 24th. We look at the Valor by itself. The Valor by itself only brought us 40% control on June 11th and 12% control on, on July 24th. So actually the sulfentrazone in this case actually did a little bit better than in this trial this year um, than the uh, than the Valor by itself. Hmm. You look though at Valor last year in, in 2019, the Valor did extremely well by itself at 92% control and the Spartan Charge last year was only 51% control. 
you know, so it didn't do as well last year. Um, we, we increased the rate of, of the Spartan charge this year, and we, we brought that up because last year we didn't have the rate really where we, where we should have had it because of um, the, the organic matter of the soils and the texture of the soil here. So last year, used at a lower rate, this year at a higher rate in 2020 to, to place it um, better on the soils that we were dealing with here. So yeah. that's what we had for, you know, for treatments on this one. So right here, this, this treatment is uh, Spartan Charge um, with the addition of five ounces of Metribuzin. It, uh, it, on June 11th, we had 78% control. Didn't hold on as well, even with the addition of the Metribuzin. Because it, um, on the 24th, we were down below 40% control at 36 here um, on July 24th. So you can see the Spartan Charge plus Metribuzin, not a whole lot different between the Spartan Charge um, by itself. The final treatment of the trial, we have Authority Elite um, at 26 ounces um, per acre and 5 ounces of Metribuse. And Authority Elite is a combination, a premix of Sulfentrazone and Dual 2 Magnum. So we have a Dual 2 Magnum Sulfentrazone mix here. Again, Authority Elite not registered in New York State for use on soybeans. Um, we use that. We ended up with, uh, you know, last year at the 26 ounce rate did, uh, um, did very well at 98% control. This year didn't do nearly as well for us. Um, you know, we were 81% control on, on the um, middle, you know, June 11th, and then we were down to 32% control the uh, end of July. So that's what we have here for these. Looking again, more of a comparison or, or you know, demonstration of, you know, how do these compare, um, you know, the flumioxazin, you know, versus like a sulfentrazone in the trial to see if sulfentrazone you know, could be an addition for us possibly in the state, you know, if we were ever to get registration on, on soybeans. And so that's why we're looking yep. at it here. And we also have it in, in another trial um, in New York looking at it, um, uh, another soybean trial as well. Okay, I'm going to pause it here. You all have this in your handout that came in the email, your registration email, uh, if you want to look back at it. But just wanted to pause and uh, go over these, uh, these final ratings. Um, do keep in mind that these were done in early August. So, you know, the pre's only aren't going to look so good. Um, and as Mike has said, uh, you know, probably that 30 day, that June rating of the control is better for the pre's. Um, but this is, you know, this is looking at end of the season. How did these programs do? And um, overall, the, the results were fairly comparable for the soybeans. It, 
you know, being in the drought, we felt like we weren't getting as good control. And a, a lot of times they were five to 10% uh, less this year than last year. Um, and uh, well, I guess one of the big differences was the Spartan charge there, number 14, which I think was a result of a, a higher rate this year, uh, more appropriate for the soil um, organic matter in the field. But uh, any questions on these final herbicide ratings before we move on to yield? Or any comments? Brian, there was a question in the chat box about organic water hemp incidences in organic. Yeah, um, I haven't heard any. And, um, you know, I, I think that the funny thing is that if it was on an organic farm that, you know, there would never be any reason to distinguish it from a pigweed. You know, it, it, we see it on the conventional farms because it survives, uh, you know, the Roundup and the the ALS inhibitors and some of the um, photosystem two inhibitors. So yeah, I, I haven't heard any reports of it on organic farms, um, but it, I think they're a lot less likely to find it since it's not gonna be sticking out like a sore thumb. So Emmeline uh, had a, a question about <clears throat> whether we tracked expenses of each of the individual programs. We have, we have estimates of those and we put those in a, um, in a report that I can share in the link um, once we get going here again. Um, and I'll share those, but yeah, they are just estimates from various, um, you know, custom applicators and, you know, those costs do change. Um, and so it's, it's, you know, it's very subject to change and, and yeah, I think overall, you're going to see higher costs for the two pass systems. Uh, and we'll, we'll come to address that, I think, later on in the video, that really it's just, you know, it's just the cost of doing business. If you've got herbicide resistant weeds, um, you know, we, we can't not control them. Um, and so we've got to spend a little money to do that. Brian, you have another question in the chat about the treatment number 12. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think I think the main difference between the results for treatment 12 there between the two years was that um, we didn't we didn't have much emergence after the post application in 2019 because we had a later start. So a lot of the water hemp had already emerged. And so the warrant that residual product didn't come into play. Um, but whether or not that, dis that difference is actually significant or not, uh, I haven't analyzed yet statistically. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I'll start the video again.
And I'll pause it again here. Uh, once again, this is in your, uh, your handout. Um, overall, we had better yields this year. I think the, the old saying, the, uh, uh, a, a dry year will scare you, but a wet year will kill you kind of uh, is at play here and that we had a really wet spring in 2019 that really set back those soybeans, uh, never really recovered. We never had anything close to canopy closure. Um, and, and that really came out in these yields here. Um, overall, uh, we're gonna see the trend is that there's better yields as you would expect where we controlled the water hemp more effectively um, last year. Uh, and maybe to some extent this year too, we had a little bit of injury uh, from the Cobra. Um, so that may have contributed to a little a little bit of yield loss, um, but it's primarily due to the weed competition. Any questions or comments on yield, soybean yield? All right, well, I'll start the video again. And actually, before I do, I should give a little intro into the corn treatments. Um, same idea, we're just looking for, uh, you know, which integrated systems with a variety of different chemistries and tactics is gonna most effectively control the water hemp in corn. These trials were done in the same field as the soybean treatments right next door. For those of you who uh, saw the, the plots, uh, the field day last year in person, it's in that same field. And um, again, we look at individual residual products first, just to see kind of who's pulling their weight. And then we look at more realistic kind of combined pre-mixes and tank mixes and two pass programs. All right, so I'll start that. You sh you should you should see the soil health under here. Um yeah, okay, so this is our control. Um similar to the soybean plots, we've got about five, six foot tall water hemp here. I think that the water hemp population is maybe a little bit denser towards this end of the field. Um Got a mix male and female plants in here. Uh, some of them, if I grab some of the potential seed heads, they're, they're not quite setting seed yet. Uh, so still, still maturing, which is good for us.
second. Okay, so we've got Resolve Q. Again. So this is a ALS inhibitor. Um, very little control, 11% control. Um, did control some of the other weeds, some of the grasses. Okay, here we have atrazine, treatment three here. Four pints. And uh, the water hemp isn't quite as tall, there isn't quite as much of it, but uh, control is only around half. Um, atrazine, like metribuzin, is, is uh, a photosystem two inhibitor. We're not, we're not counting on, on, uh, on control. Uh, we have some resistance based on our greenhouse work. Wow, one of those in there is pretty tall. Um, one thing I do notice is that when, when you have some of these early pre's, they, they knock down the density, but uh, you know, the water hemp is, is so um, flexible that it can make up for that low density and each individual plant gets a lot bigger. Except for the seed loss in the plants, so your seed loss and your seed numbers may stay the same in certain situations. If you, yeah, but these plants get big. But again, an advantage that I like about the pre, you know, granted we did have you know water hemp come through here. We've knocked out all the other species, so when it comes back in for our post-emergence application, what we're looking at is we're coming back in solely for really for water hemp in there for that post. Mm -hmm. So it makes our herbicide selection that we put in our tank mix the next time a lot easier because again, single species, we can target that single species at the right height because if all of a sudden we had water hemp at a certain height and then we had, you know, crabgrass or fall panicum or ragweed or something else in here, you know, what are we going to do? You know, what are the heights? You know, we have to kind of pick our poison, right? Right. Of what we're going to use. Yeah. Great. So then we got Callisto. So, so Callisto, uh, just by itself, this year and last year was the most effective pre-only treatment. Um, and as of about 30 days after application, was controlling around 93% of the weeds. So, very effective and. Once again, you're knocking down the numbers that you're going to have to come back in and control with a post application. Yeah, by itself, it did pretty good. You know, early on, you know, 93% control in June, so it, it did its job. What I'd like to see in a treatment, we didn't have these together. What was that? The... Callistoatrazine. Callistoatrazine. Because you look at some of these other universities, Mike, and actually you look at Canada, yeah. that's one of their top. Callisto and atrazine, right? One of their top programs. Right those two together so I don't know what that so, was. so our next one we have the harness max so you do have the group 15 with it so you have yeah. atrazine with a harness max yeah and, and again that turned out really well yeah and and just as a as a side note uh, we did spray the Callisto and atrazine on some of the buffer areas around the plots and unfortunately it was it was so dry that it it, it, it really didn't um, get taken up by the plants at all and had very little effect um, this year. I, I think I think in a normal year, you would have seen some of that synergy that that they talk about in other states between the the uh, Callisto and the atrazine. But I don't know they're very comparable with each other. Okay, in treatment five. We've got Acuron. So we're looking at atrazine, dual two magnum, Callisto, and bicyclopyrum are the active ingredients in Acuron. This is uh, 
this is a, a premix, which is which is great. Makes things easy. Uh, looks very clean. Yeah, Harness Max, so uh, basically Harness plus the Callisto, uh, Group 15 and Group 27, plus Atrazine. And this was one of our, our best treatments last year, and also one of, one of the ones that had the most bang for the buck, in that you know, it wasn't quite as expensive as some of the others, um, but did provide 100% control last year. This, this year, not quite as good. Uh, due to the weather, but still uh, very effective. Treatment number seven, and this was a big surprise for me. This is this is atrazine plus Callisto. Oh, so we do have it, Mike. Yeah, it's post. Yeah, okay, it's I post. see, I see. Yeah, and so last year we were looking at 89% control. This year we're at 13% control. And this was a real surprise because right after the application, I came out with, with Venezia and we saw some bleaching in the center of the whirl um, and it looked to be, it looked like it was, was working on the plants and that they would soon go down. Um, but I think just with the lack of, of water and the stress of these plants that the products didn't translocate as they should have uh, and were able to bounce back. Okay, and here's our kitchen sink treatment, treatment number eight a pre-application of Acuron, 2.5 quarts per acre, followed by a post-application of Status, and I think I only see one or two water hemp. So, so really good control. Um, now there are we did replicate this four times, so some of the other ones might not look this good. Um, but you know this is our kitchen sink approach here, two pass with, let's see, uh, eight different active ingredients and uh, six different herbicide sites of action used. And and one of the reasons for using status. Um, uh, other than, than not having Roundup Ready corn in this, this treatment was that the status allows you to, uh, to spray up to 36 inches of the corn, whereas other products uh, that include dicamba uh, have to be used much earlier than that. In that lower rate. I mean, that was the other thing, too. Because as, as, as we get taller with dicamba products, you know, the Banvilles um, or their dicambas, you know, when the corn is short, we can use higher rates. When the corn gets taller, we have to use lower rates. And that would be the issue that you do. Because if you get up to 36 inch tall corn with dicamba, you know, our rates wouldn't have been high enough. Status fits that bill where you can come in with a high rate of dicamba, basically, um, you know, on that taller corn. And it, it looks fantastic. I mean, there's no doubt about it. It's clean. Anyone want to take on the, the question of whether growers can afford it. There's no question Price about it. Doing, you're reading management business. I mean, you know, you look at you look at any you take the untreated check versus any of our treatments we have here, everybody's gonna take a treatment and pay for whatever treatment we had because they were so much better than the untreated check. Mm -hmm. I mean the payback is there. Yeah. I mean are, are we approaching a price at which it just it, it, it starts to make sense to do other things. I think I, I think sometimes we get too caught up in in the price of these herbicide programs. You know, I know I know people get really wound up with it. That you know, yeah, it's a big investment, but we're talking about situations with with water hemp and Palmer amaranth where you know it's going to be a two pass program. It's going to be expensive, and we're you know we need to try to shoot for that goal to achieve more than more control than we've ever controlled because we don't want to leave anything behind. You know, so there's that cost. So what what is our cost? If if we try to cut corners, what's the cost down the road with seed? You know, the weed seed bank that you and Mike yeah. talked about earlier.
So here, treatment nine, we've got Acuron use pre, followed by row cultivation post to control any escapes of the of the Acuron. And uh, the, the control is a little bit better than Acuron used just by itself. So as you'd expect that, you know, the cultivation would control those weeds between the rows pretty well. Uh, there are a few right in the row with the corn that have have managed to escape the cultivation and are, are now getting pretty tall. Um, but between rows look pretty clean. Um, one thing on the Acuron, um, you wanna wait as long as possible if you're integrating in cultivation with herbicides because you've got this nice residual herbicide barrier and you don't wanna be going up and uh, you know, breaking that up with cultivation, allowing weeds to, to germinate and emerge through that broken barrier. Um, so waiting until that barrier breaks down, uh, watching your fields using scouting is very important if you're using cultivation. Our treatment with is interseeding, and this was a, uh, a pre-application of a reduced rate of Callisto because we knew we were going to, coming in with interseeding. We didn't want to injure the, the interseeded annular ryegrass. And uh, row cultivation was again used to clean up the row middles right before interseeding. And for these plots, uh, the interseeding was done by hand, and so it, it was just broadcast. Um, whereas up in the North Country in Turin, we've got another trial uh, where it was actually interseeded um, using a Penn State interseeder, uh, three rows per, um, per corn row. And uh, Callisto from our trials last year at Turin was provided the best combination of weed control while not, uh, while not injuring the annual ryegrass at all. So if, you, if you're interested in interseeding with annual ryegrass and you have herbicide resistant water hemp, uh, Callisto seems to be uh, one of the best options. Now, so Mike, with that Western New York Soil Health Alliance, they're really into the, the interseeding, right? Are, yeah. are they doing it primarily in corn? Yeah, no, and there's no soybeans at this point. Okay. It's, it's, it's primarily corn. And, uh, soybeans is a little tougher to do. Yeah. And they're using it for the soil health reasons, or also forage, or yeah, most of it's it's, it's soil health. Some will take can, could take some things off, but in most cases we're just looking at soil health, keeping the keeping the soil covered and uptaking manure and keeping those nutrients in place for next year. Okay, I'm going to pause the video here, and uh, once again, these are the final weed control ratings done in early August, so this is kind of what you're left with, and uh, we had to um, uh, nix a couple of the treatments this year. We just didn't have room to fit them in the field, um, unfortunately. Uh, Acuron used post and status resolve Q used post. Um, but uh, overall, um, fairly similar results to last year. Uh, maybe not quite as good, again, due to the drought, I think. Um, and one of the main differences was that big surprise of uh, treatment seven, the, uh, the atrazine Callisto, just, I think, not really uh, being up, up, uptook and translocated by the weeds as they should have been because of the drought. Anyone have any comments or questions on that? So Brian, you made the comment that the harness max and atrazine was the most economical 
of the treatments. Do you, know, do you recall what the difference was between that and let's say Acuron? Um, I don't, Jeff, and uh, and yeah, and, and I couldn't actually share that while I was playing the video. But um, after the video ends, I can find the uh, the documents and online and share the links to those, so folks can have a look. Does this look like anyone's? Uh, herbicide program that they've tried or is it uh, way more intensive or how does it compare? Uh, there's a question about Caprino. I don't, I don't have experience with Caprino. Does, does do any of the other hosts? Yeah, my, um, I could add to that. Um, Caprino, we don't have any here, um, as, as you said, Brian, in, in New York on it, um, but they have used um, Peter Sickema in Ontario. He's used it um, in his glyphosate resistant water hemp trials up there in Ontario. And Caprino um, by itself, um, his control is, um, it's in that, you know, the high 60s with it. Um, didn't do you know, in the trials that he's done, it didn't um, it didn't do as well as is the Callisto and atrazine. Um, Callisto and atrazine has consistently been a, a really good program post emergence for Peter um, up in Ontario. And again, it's uh, you know that's what we have for it here. Um, you know, just for for information, local information. If we want to try to use that, local is is Ontario local enough for us. But uh, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, great. Okay. I could, what I can do is I can share, if anyone's interested, they can email me and I can share you some of that, uh, the work um, that I'm citing there from Peter Sycama, um up in, from the University of Guelph there on, mm -hmm. uh, on his, because he has, they have some other products that, you know, that have done, done well um, in soybeans, um, you know, some of their better, better treatments or products that we don't have registered, unfortunately, here in, in New York State. Um, mm -hmm. And so I can share that with you guys. <laughs> Great, thanks, Mike. Okay, starting the video again. We're we're almost through. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't get uh, corn yield. There was just too much variability, uh, primarily due to the dry conditions again. With some of the corns, you know, germinating and starting, getting a good head start on the rest of the corn. Um, so just too much variability in the corn for the uh, the yield to really make sense. Um, but overall, you know, these two pass programs with at least two sites of action that are effective on water hemp were generally the most effective. And uh, I want to give a big thank you to Jen Thomas Murphy, who I think is still on the call and um, who did all of our uh, filming and has helped a lot with the tech side of things. And also a uh, big thanks to our funders, um, including New York Farm Viability. So um, we, we had a few questions earlier on in the chat that we could maybe get to. Uh, uh, Mike Hunter, there was a question about uh, mare's tail and I, I know you got to do some trials with that and, and maybe you could speak to how mare's tail compares to water hemp overall. Yeah, okay, so yeah, so how does mare's tail compare overall? So yeah, that, that was interesting. Um, so yeah, there's going to be two uh, two different uh, thoughts on that one. So I I had an opportunity at uh, at the CCA conference to uh, to moderate a panel with some of the industry people, um, you know, chemical industry people, and that was one of the questions that I did ask the group, and it was interesting. Um, their feedback is, you know, given the choice, I gave them the choice. You know, would you rather have water hemp on your farm to deal with, or would you rather have mare's tail? And everybody on the panel except for one, one said. I'd rather take mare's tail because I have, I have choices. Um, you know, the other said, you know, the other said, you know, or no, everybody said, well, um, they would rather have mare's tail. Um, one said, uh, you know, water hemp, but it's, it's a case that water hemp is, we can, we can manage that. I think easier on our own farm because of the spread of the way the, 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 the weed seeds move. 
Mare's Tail, it's going to be tough because Mare's Tail, we, we have no, I mean, it, that, that's a community problem because it's windblown seeds. So, so the Mare's Tail, the way it spreads, I mean, you can do everything you want, you know, right on your farm, you know, but you could have a neighbor or somebody else in the neighborhood or, you know, the highway crews with the guardrails, um, signs, you know, along the highways. We see that. We see resistant Mare's Tail in those situations. And that's just going to contribute to the problems on, on our own farms. Um, so Mare's Tail, we do have, um, we do have work with, uh, with Mare's Tail, uh, resistant Mare's Tail trial here in New York State. I have a location in Jefferson County. And if anybody would like to, sh I can share the results um, through an email um, to, to anybody that would like it. I can um, put that together. I had a uh, number of pre-treatments in there and we had post-treatments as well. Um, and so again, if you want to just uh, contact me directly through, through email at uh, meh27 at cornell.edu, I'd be more than happy to share the results of that. So if people don't see it, uh, Brian has <clears throat> posted the links to the cost estimates, both the corn and soybean herbicides. So if you go to the chat box, you can click on those links. You can actually just save them in favorites and come back to them at a later date if you'd like. Yeah, and those are our uh, reports from last year. We have a and the couple. Other, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, we have a couple of polling questions. If you want to move to that now, Brian. Absolutely. Yep. Okay. Are you going to? I post had a those? quick question. The, yep. The mare's tail question. What was the mare's tail question specifically on the chat? I'm trying to find it. I think it was up at the top. Just someone generally looking for uh, mare's tail info. Okay, yeah, the mare's yeah. tail info. The one thing I would say that, you know, as we look at all these soybean treatments that we had today, and we look at, you know, mare's tail treatments, we're going to find some of the products that are very similar. The metribuzin, that's going to be, again, you know, uh, that's going to be the foundation for a lot of our programs, you know, when we're looking at the tall water hemp and palmer and also mare's tail. Um, when we get into some of, you know, the mare's tail situations that we deal with, with the multiple resistant mare's tail, again, a lot of our group twos, um, you know, assuming that our multiple resistant mare's tail in our horse weed in the state is going to be resistant to the group twos and the group nines, which is a glyphosate. Um, so the, the multiple resistant mare's tail, the group twos are going to be off the table, um, you know, going to, going to limit us to control um, even more so than it would be with with tall water hemp because tall water hemp you know remember we can still control that in soybeans post emergence with our group 14s like cobra and, and the flex star that doesn't give us that option in mare's tail because our group 14s post emergence aren't going to be effective um, for us on the, on the mare's tail so flex star reflex you know cobra they aren't going to work post emergence on on, on mare's tail resistant or not so that's going to be some of the differences that we have. Yeah, hopefully folks don't have both at the same time. Huh? <laughs> yeah, that would that would be a tough situation to find. And I don't I've not seen it. And I don't think I don't know. I'd be curious if anybody on the on the on the call today has ever seen the two um, in the same field together. Uh, I've not heard of that, but it's quite possible it could be. Yeah, great. All right, just a couple minutes left. Jeff, do you want to start the polling questions? Sure just thing. Just two, two quick questions before you sign off. And so the first is going to be about weed control practices, and you can select more than one of the options. Okay, yep, so this one's just for the farmers in the audience. Oh, interesting, I wonder what other would be.
Yeah, so I, I know we have a lot of educators and agribusiness folks on the call, so uh, we can probably move to the next one if uh, it looks like all the farmers have voted. Okay, a lot of two pass interests, which is great. So just so that everybody else can see these, these were the results of the poll for the group. Looks good, Jeff. And you want to start the next one? Sure thing. Okay, so there's kind of a misstep there. The second question was, um, as a result of going through this virtual tour today, uh, did you learn some methods? Well, here we go. <laughs> here's the here's the poll, water hunt control. I got it for you, Jeff. All right, thank you. <laughs> so this is a yes, no question for everybody. All right, so uh, the, the indication is that most people are coming away with uh, some options of what they would employ to control water hemp on their farms. That's great. All right, so we've got some credits now to hand out. Yes, sir. Ryan, I got one other thing to add. I just, uh, um, while you were doing the polls, I did double check and look back at, uh, at two of the trials that, uh, that I referenced there from Ontario, from the University of Guelph, looking at, uh, you know, the Caprino control on, on the resistant water hemp. And again, it didn't, uh, didn't do in the trials that, that, uh, that he had did not do as well as um, some of the other group 27s, but the group 27s that he had in all fairness, um, and it, I don't know the, the, the resistance, um, you know, it was glyphosate resistant water hemp is what the trials were tagged as, um, but his comparisons were using impact and armazon um, plus atrazine and then Callisto atrazine also as the treatments, the Caprino in that, um, in the trials that he had was Caprino alone by itself without the atrazine. So I'm not sure. Um, so that could have been some of the um, some of the reasoning why the Caprino may not have done as as well as the impact atrazine or armazine at armazine atrazine or the Callisto atrazine in the trial as well. So it may not be an apples to apples comparison there without the atrazine. Okay, gotcha. Thanks, Mike. All right. Well, we're a couple of minutes over, but we started a little late too. So um, yeah, let's get those credits going. Yeah, we need to retype. Retype your name and number like you did in the beginning back in there. Um, Roy Ike, I see you're on here actually twice. I know you you wanted credits, but I did not have not seen you in the chat. <laughs> so you need to type into that chat um, to get those credits. And I can definitely see people are entering their first, last name, and certification number. That's what you need to do to get credit for today. I'm going to share my screen now.
So vote for those of you that have uh, certified crop advisor uh, tenure uh, and you want to earn CEUs for today's meetings, uh, you can do one of two things. If you have the CCA app, you can actually scan the NCR code that's on this page and that'll give you instantaneous uh, credits or you can take a picture of the screen and then use the information on the screen to fill out a report at the CCA website. So this was broken up into three pieces. This is one of the NCR codes. Now on your screen is the second NCR code. So it's important for you to either scan this code, the NCR code, or to take a picture of the screen now. Jeff, can you uh, close out the polling uh, question? It's, it's kind of right in the middle of the page. Is it out of there now? It's not, it's still there. The CCA stuff disappeared and the polling question number two is still there. Mike, you should be able to close, it should be a little pop-up window that you should be able to close yourself. Okay. It's me, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, I, thought uh, I didn't have control of that. So going back to the CCA credits, this was the second part of the meeting. And what's on your screen right now is the third part of the meeting. So again, you need to either scan the NCR code or take a picture of this page now and then fill it out online when you get to the CCA website. So hopefully everybody's had a chance to either put their name and certification number back in to get DEC credit or take a picture or scan those three pages to get your CCA credits. Maybe you wanna close us out, Mike? Yeah, so uh, guys, this was our kind of our first shot at doing something like this virtually. Um, we know we're going to have to do, do more of these. So it's a little rough on the edges sometimes, but overall I'm, I'm very pleased with the way the video came out. Um, we had to do it a little grainy. We had it at a higher, higher, you know, resolution, but it, it was really choppy. And so I think that helped to, to back off the, the quality, maybe a little bit there to get the picture actually to come through better. So otherwise, uh, I thought it went very well, you know, some of your comments, you know, if you want to email some of us on the side to let us know if there's changes you felt could have been made to make this better next time. But other than that, I uh, hope you learned something in regards to water hemp. If in the future, if you think you have water hemp, please email one of us some pictures, call us, let us know. Uh, be happy if we're close to come out and take a look and confirm it. 
but uh, I think the big thing for us is to you know keep track of this where it's at. Uh, we didn't even talk about Palmer Amaranth uh, because that's in smaller locations, but that may be our next next draw here is to do something with Palmer Amaranth. But at this point, water hemp's kind of our focus. And uh, again, hope you took home some, something home today in regards to control. And uh, I'm sure we'll see you more virtually here, unfortunately, this winter, whether it be one of the Congresses or some of the other larger meetings. Anybody else? That's perfect. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everybody.